guessing I am live uh, now. I was told I'd have a few seconds and then the stream would start. So welcome everybody to the 15th episode of Live Design on the SolidWorks YouTube channel. Super happy to see everybody here. See, we've got some comments going in the chat already. Eric, good to see you here. I think you've made it to all 16 of these now. Um, so today we thought we'd try something a little bit different. Um, we've had 14 episodes prior to this. We thought it might be a, uh, a good opportunity to answer some of the questions we've seen in the comment section, not the live chat, but in the comment section below. I did look at some of the uh, uh, comments as we went through the stream, um, but uh, we're predominantly gonna do that. And then we're also going to be looking at the uh, live chat as well here today. So as we go through, if you have any questions, um, feel free to post those in the comments section and we'll try to answer those. I have a couple folks helping me out in the comment section. I've got a uh, little cat crackling in my audio. I'm not sure if uh, what I can do to, to fix that at this point <laughs> we're streaming now. So, so I apologize for any of that. Um, We've got Mark Schneider is in the chat. Jan, uh, Jan is in the chat. He's with on my team. And I believe um, we also have, uh, I think we might have Mark Peterson in the chat as well. So if you ask questions and I don't a answer them directly, I have a couple people who are going to be kind of helping that. So by the way, uh, I'll do, you know, I did one of these uh, about six weeks ago and I failed to properly introduce myself. My name is Jeremy Rignaris. Um, I'm on the uh, technical team here at SolidWorks. I figured I'll, I'll do what everybody else has been doing and give you a little bit of an insight as to where I'm sitting in my home office from. I'm located in a really tiny town uh, in the state of Michigan in the United States called Hudsonville. There's not a whole lot going on here. It's pretty quiet. Uh, this town is predominantly just outside of the, uh, the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. So if anybody, we have a team that's located all over the country. I live about 20 minutes from uh, Lake Michigan. So our weather is completely defined by the Great Lakes. So that's that's where I'm from. So I, what I want to do is I want to dive into some of these questions. Oh, I didn't show my screen as I went through any of that. My bad. Let me uh, let me go over to this one here. <laughs> um, I'm not going to bother going through that again. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to answer some of the questions that we've seen show up in the previous uh, chat here. So what I did, I kind of went back through all the previous episodes and I'm going to dive into those. So the first question we had was from Pete Pablo. He, on the very first episode, he says he loves all the little tips, but how can he sign up to become notified every time that we release a new video? And this is something on YouTube, if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, it'll be on the lower left-hand side of me. There will be two buttons. There is a subscribe to this channel, which I encourage everybody to do. And then there is a little bell notification icon. So for example, I just got an email that said that this uh, video was going live. If you click that bell notification icon with your YouTube account, Every Friday at one o'clock, you'll get a reminder that we're going live with live design and also events like SolidWorks Live, where we get an opportunity to interview really cool customers. Uh, this uh, last week, earlier this week, I actually had the chance to sit down with Emilio Lopez from SOP Technologies, which is uh, an acronym for Save Our Planet. I encourage you, if you're really interested in somebody who was a startup with no engineering background, go check out that SolidWorks Live video. That's a really cool interview about somebody who came into our SolidWorks for Startups program. And there's lots of information where you folks can learn more about that too. So, all right. So the next question we ran into was, there's a lot of questions on completing CSWP. And I actually, see, I actually saw some of those in the chat here, how to prepare for CSWE. So I'm going to give you a couple pointers. I'm not obviously this isn't going to be a whole how to prepare for CSWP and CSWE, but the first thing I want to do is I really want everybody to be aware 
aware of a website out here that you can go to. If you go to the solidworks.com website and you search for certifications, uh, you can actually just search Google for SolidWorks CSWP and this is the link that will come up. You will uh, find this website, uh, which will give you information both on the CSWP, how to sign up and take the exam. But one of the cool things here is there is an example CSWP exam as well. So this is a really close approximation of the type of work that you would run into on the CSWP exam as you went through it. So you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff in here that you would need to know and understand how to prepare for the exam. And then there is a practice exam in here that you can download and take as well. You're also looking for uh, tips on how to tackle the CSWP exam. One of the things that I would highly recommend is on our SolidWorks blog. So if you go to My SolidWorks, so we're gonna go into My SolidWorks here. And I'll log in. I should have been logged in prior to this. And what we're going to do is we're going to search for Model Mania on here. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to filter this down by our blogs over here. So in our content, uh, not our forums, I just hit the wrong thing. Um, so uh, on our, if you go to the SolidWorks blogs and you search for Model Mania, you're going to find Mark Schneider's uh, presentation that he did. I'm looking for this really quick here. This is a bad example of, uh, let's see if we can't get this here now. Videos, no, yes. There's a ton of videos in here. I actually think I'm in the wrong part of this website here. But if, uh, if you go to the SolidWorks blog, you can find the Model Mania videos. If you can work your way through 20 years of Model Mania, you stand a really solid chance of being able to pass the CSWP exam. It doesn't cover any of the assembly techniques that you would go through, but um, you'll definitely, uh, you'll be well prepared for all the core modeling stuff. So let's take a quick look at the chat here. Uh, stuff about certification, yes. Uh, are there any qualifications required for certification? To take CSWP, there are no qualifications that are required for CSWP. However, if you want to take any of the advanced exams or the CSWE, that does have the prerequisite that you need to have passed the CSWP for professional exam. And then you can go through and you could take an advanced exam, such as sheet metal, mold tool design, surfacing, whatever you want. And then once you pass, I believe it's three of those, then you qualify to take the CSWE or expert exam. So that's a good question there. Um, I see a question from Eric about something about extend surface. We'll take a look at that in a little bit. Um, my mic is popping really bad. Unfortunately, I don't know, like, I will take a look at this and see if I can fix this a little bit here. Let me... I'm gonna actually try to turn it down to keep it from crackling a little bit. Let me go into the properties here. There's really no settings that I can do to avoid that. I apologize uh, for the microphone if that happens to be the case. Um, one of the other things that I was commented on, if you're curious about the CSWP exam, if you've ever taken a SolidWorks Essentials class with your SolidWorks reseller, you are absolutely covered and prepared to take the CSWP exam as well. Everything you need to pass CSWP, you would learn in the essentials training classes from your SolidWorks reseller. So as for cost, I uh, Chuck asked the question about cost. I don't know the cost of taking the exam. I believe people who are on subscription, it's actually included as part of their subscription, but don't quote me on that. Um, uh, but uh, I don't know the individual cost. You'll want to reach out to a local reseller uh, to learn more about that. So um, is the SolidWorks going to carry these on after the C-19 lockdown? Yes, we are actually. Um, OK, so I was just informed if you are on subscription, you get two free certification exams each year. So really good value for being on subscription with SolidWorks there. 
back to that question that CH3, uh, 5T3RD ask, will these carry on? Absolutely, we are going to continue on with these moving forward. In fact, that brings us up to our next question. So I wanna jump over to my questions. One of the things that we've been asked very often are some of our other applications. Can we host those on here? Great news, next Friday at 1 p.m. on Live Design, Mike Sandy's going to walk through SolidWorks Visualize and he's gonna show you how to set up your models, make photorealistic renderings, really cool stuff like that uh, with SolidWorks Visualize. So next week's gonna be a departure from creating a model from scratch, you're gonna be creating a rendering from scratch. So really, really cool uh, opportunity for that. And then, um, we have some other really unique things coming up. Michael Steves presented on SolidWorks Live Design a while back. He's gonna be joining us. Uh, let me get the exact date here really quick. Michael Steves is right now looking at joining us on July 10th. Oh, by the way, July 3rd will be the one Friday we do not do a live design. That is a holiday here in the United States, uh, the fourth, the day after. So our company will uh, likely be off on the third. So then the following week on the 10th, Michael Steves is going to sit down. He sneak previewed a little bit about how to get kids involved in engineering on his live design. If you're really interested in learning how to get kids more involved in engineering, stay tuned on July 10th for Michael Steves. He's going to show apps for kids, 3D modeling tools that are really friendly for uh, young kids to get involved and understand the basics of 3D modeling. So... Um, then when we come back from that break, uh, we're going to have a SolidWorks live event on the 16th of July. This is going to be really exciting. We're going to be announcing a whole new set of products from SolidWorks. Um, thanks Chester. Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to be announcing a whole new, uh, set of offers from SolidWorks. I really encourage you to tune in on the 16th of July. It's going to be really exciting. Our entire company is really, really exciting about the uh, excited about this. So much so that the following day on the seventh Friday, the 17th, our own Brian Zayas is going to do a live design using these new design tools. So uh, stay tuned for that. And then probably the uh, other most asked for live design videos we've gotten in questions was simulation. We heard you loud and clear. And Omar Zoni, uh, August 7th, is going to be uh, showing you guys some simulation and FEA tools here on Live Design. And it looks like he's even signed up for one later on in September. The rest of the schedule is not packed yet. This is still kind of everybody raising their hand and volunteering to do these as we go through here. So I'm sure everybody is waiting to see some actual tips and tricks here and not just announcements. So I have one more uh, website thing that we're going to show and then we're going to dive into the tips and tricks part of this. There was a question on episode two from Motion, uh, and I'm really sorry if I get this name wrong. Uh, Mosin Ojani asked, how can he enable real view graphics? So this is a question we actually get a lot. And this has to do with hardware that you're using on your computer. So I want to really quickly show uh, on the SolidWorks website, you simply Google, uh, so if you go to solidworks.com slash support slash hardware dash certification, or if you just Google SolidWorks hardware certification, you'll find this webpage. Um, Real view graphics actually requires that you have a professional level graphics card to be able to uh, enable it. Um, that is going to require a like a quattro level card. So if you're at home with an NVIDIA GeForce graphics card, unfortunately, you won't be able to enable real view graphics on your computer. So some people run into that. They don't uh, realize that. If for some reason you have a Quattro graphics card, you can come to this website. So for example, let's say I have a P5000 graphics card. I can come into here and I can search for this and I'll find all the computers that are certified for this. You can also, I believe, just find just the uh, 
the P5000 graphics card, but you'll notice they all use the exact same driver here. So this link will allow you to download the most current certified driver to use inside of SolidWorks to enable real, real view graphics on your computer. Again, these often require that you have a high-end professional workstation card to be able to do it. So, all right. I also see that we have somebody asking for uh, more assembly focused ones. We are looking at potentially expanding the scope of live design to be a little more complex. So instead of starting with a blank canvas, you'll be able to start with an, an assembly and we'll be able to do some more assembly tips and tricks. I agree. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Siddharth. Uh, I agree. I'd love to see some more assembly stuff. Um, and I'd like to go through that. We also had a request to do some API ones. I'm not so sure like if the broader audience would be interested in that, but maybe if we set aside a day, we could do an API episode. Um, and that way, if people don't want to tune in for that one, they don't have to. So we're going to try to broaden out and cover a lot more topics. So I want to get into some of these other questions here. Um, we First episode, uh, Michael Manchester was following along and he got stuck with an example where a sketch turned gray and told him that it uh, had to be uh, defined as a driven sketch entity. So what I wanna do here is I wanna show why this might happen here. So I'm gonna just gonna open up a, a simple sketch here and there's already some geometry in the background. I'm gonna keep this really simple so it's obvious why this happens. So, all right, Barry, maybe we'll put that on the schedule, some API ones. I actually spend some time in uh, uh, I use some Visual Basic myself and some C Sharp. So maybe we go through and uh, do some API stuff, Barry. All right, so I'm gonna start a sketch here. I'm not going to edit the sketch I have originally done, but um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw some geometry. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna draw a rectangle. Let me turn on my lock here. And we're gonna go about like this. And I want this to be, say, 50 millimeters off from the bottom of this sketch. And when I do this, I get this notification that pops up that says, make this dimension driven. And the first question that comes to people's mind is, why has this happened? I don't understand. And in fact, if I choose the other option and hit OK, the geometry in my sketch is showing me these brown colors. Let's see if anybody in chat knows why this happened. Like why, why is that 33? Why couldn't I make that dimension 50 millimeters? Does anybody know why that might have happened? I'm going to quick watch the chat. I'm sure there's a delay here really quick. So I might not do this, uh, ask the question and, and wait for an answer here. So what's happened here is, um, when I drew this sketch geometry, there was something underneath it. This could be another sketch entity. This could be a model edge or something like this. And what happened was, is I actually clicked on a point on the sketch below it. And what's happened is, is that has set the height of where I want this sketch entity to be right here. So if you ever run into this, you're like, I don't know why my sketch is over defining when I add this dimension. I need this to be 50 millimeters. Up here in this view drop down menu, there's a lot of different things that you can turn on. And one of these is something called sketch relations. And when I turn this on, you can see I have a vertical, a vertical, a horizontal, a horizontal, and then look at this, I created a coincident relationship right here on an entity that was behind my sketch. And this happens to people a lot. They're sketching and they accidentally click on something and don't realize it. So here's a tip, turn on those sketch relationships and you can turn that on and off. And now all I have to do is select that and I can delete that sketch relationship. And now I can come in here and I can go ahead and I can add that 50 millimeter dimension that I wanted to and SolidWorks isn't mad at me anymore. Let's make this 25, let's make this uh, 20, and then look what happened. So now all my geometry is shifted over to the right-hand side. Why is that? Well, that coincident relationship was actually locking me on to this entity. 
Here's a good opportunity to show where this 50 millimeter uh, or where this dropping on sketch geometry can get you in trouble. Probably would have been a better example here. When you drop something on the midpoint of a sketch entity, see how that fully defined it? So be careful when you're sketching on top of other entities so that you don't accidentally drag and drop something onto something and then create an overdefined condition. One of the other things that people sometimes run into is they may want not want to dimension it this way. They may want to come in and they may want to dimension from beginning to end. So in this case, I dimensioned this to be 25 millimeters from the top and 50 from here. But some users always want to know what this dimension is right here. Well, what you just saw, that dialog box, creating a driven dimension, you can absolutely always go in here and you can create a driven dimension and you'll notice its color is different. It's a light gray color as opposed to the bold black color there. That means that if these change, notice that value always updates to reflect the length of that line right there. So uh, just a little tip there on accidentally over-defining sketch entities by selecting things that fall underneath those. Uh, had a question in uh, the stream on that same episode that asked about being able to customize the user interface, show how to do that with search and other tools. So for this, I'm gonna open another file. I thought, you know, we always have this question pop up how do we customize the user interface inside of SolidWorks? So let's open up something. Let's open it up in an assembly because I think this is an important part of this. You see a lot of users go on here um, and they always ask like, uh, how do you customize that interface? So I'm going to show you where you can kind of find everything. Like I have a lot of, uh, hotkeys I use. Let's open up another file right here. I oftentimes want to work side by side and you'll notice how quickly I can just make my windows go up side by side. This is a hotkey I use. You may not care for that. I'm going to show you how you can set up hotkeys and kind of customize the user interface here because um, the mouse gestures are another common one that a lot of people see us do and they get caught off guard. They're like, hey, how did you do that? So let's go ahead and take a look at how to customize the user interface here a minute. Anywhere inside of the software on a toolbar, you can right click and you'll have an option down here to customize. Um, and this is gives you the option to customize a lot of different parts of the software right here. So let's take a look. The first thing you have is the ability to turn toolbars on and off. And this is probably the most common thing that people do if they're not using the command manager, which I highly recommend. Uh, but the shortcut bars, you'll see SolidWorks users all the time bringing up, we call it the S key, it's called the shortcut bar. Um, we see them bring this up often in online videos because it really speeds up productivity. Now here's the interesting thing. Notice I'm in an assembly right now. What commands do I have? The ability to insert a component, the ability to make a component, patterns, reference geometry, and show hidden components. What happens if I open up a part file though? Guess what? That shortcut menu changes. Now in this case, it's got, I have access to almost all my tools, all my uh, uh, extrude tools, all my cut extrude tools, fillets and chamfers, all my pattern types, my reference geometry, and my whole wizards right here. So let's take a look at how to customize these. So again, I, I mentioned when you're in Anywhere in SolidWorks, you right click on a toolbar, you can choose customize. The second tab here are the shortcut bars. Now, because I happen to be in a part model right now, you'll notice it's showing me the shortcut bar for my part models. Maybe I want to add the ability to, um, let's, let's find a cool feature. Let's find the flex feature or something like that. Maybe that's something I, I use all the time. So I'm gonna go down here to feature and basically I'm just gonna go in here and I'm gonna look for a feature I want. There's flex, all I have to do is drag and drop it out here. And you'll notice I can even resize this. Maybe I want it long and slender, maybe I want it short and wide. You can customize this however you want it to be. If you accidentally add a command to this you don't want, you can always click it and remove it off from the shortcut menu here as well. 
Now, what's really cool about setting this up, you don't have to open a part, an assembly, or a drawing, or a sketch to be able to customize this. See the four buttons up top here? We can grab the assembly one. So maybe when I'm working in an assembly, I want to add some new assembly tools to this. Let's see what I'm missing right here. I want an interference detection uh, to always be right at my fingertips. That's actually a pretty good one that I would want to add there. So uh, Eric says the flex feature is amazing in all caps. And uh, Stephanie Way uh, says the S key is the most very cool sp uh, specify of solid. I think that's the ve a very cool feature in SolidWorks. Um, if you master this S key, you will find that you really don't have a whole lot of need for toolbars up top. And let me explain that in a little bit more detail in just a minute. So, uh, so we can customize these. And then when we leave our command, now I took flex off of there. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm going to toggle back over to my assembly where we did add interference detection. There's my button, guess what? Now I can go ahead and I can run interference detection on this assembly. And it looks like I have some, I have an interference in here uh, with a fastener, but uh, you can see how that can come in very handy right there to quickly access tools you're using all the time. So let's go back into customize. What else can you customize in here? Well, you can grab any command, maybe that flex feature that Eric likes so much in there. I want, maybe I want to add that to my assembly tools. And I could go through here and I could look for features and I could find it again. I'm going to show you an easier way to find any command inside of SolidWorks right now. So let's go ahead. We're going to take a quick departure. I'm going to show you a tip. Up here in this drop down menu, you have the ability to search for commands inside of SolidWorks. There's a drop down menu. Now you can, by default, this will be set to my SolidWorks right here. Um, so Barry brings up an interesting point. He says he doesn't use the S key only because his left hand is on the 3D mouse. My 3D mouse is in the closet back there, so I'm not going to go grab it right now. But most of them have an extra button on them that you can map a hotkey to. You can also map it to a button on your mouse. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute so that you can access that from anywhere at any time. Uh, so that that S key is available, the shortcut bar. I don't want to call it the S key actually because I actually don't map it to the S key. I map it to my space bar. It's the biggest key on my keyboard. I can just smash my hand down and bring up that shortcut menu uh, whenever I want. Um, but anyway, I want to show you how to find a command. Let's go back to this. I'm kind of bouncing all over. Let's go up here and notice this. I can type in the flex command. Does anybody know why? the flex feature isn't appearing right now in this menu. So this was a question that came up. I did command search for combine and I couldn't find it. Does anybody know why flex isn't showing up in command search? So for example, if I do interference detection and let's, so here's interference detection. I'm able to find this right here, but for some reason I can't find flex. Command search is actually intuitive to, or it actually knows about what environment you're in. We're in an assembly right now and the flex feature happens to be an assembly tool. So how could we do this? Well, in an assembly, we can go in here and we can choose to edit a part. Now watch what happens when I type interference in here. Oh, I still see interference detection, but if I type in flex, I should actually be seeing uh, the flexible command in there, but if I open the part up in its own window, and now I type flex, you can see there's my flex feature right there. So keep in mind when you use command search, it is specific to the environment you're working in. So for example, if I type line, line, that one does show up, that's bizarre. I guess I could, oh, I could create a line and it would ask me to start creating a sketch right there. But this is a case and I could search for interference detection because you can do interference detection on multi-bodies. So that's a bad example. Uh, uh, what if I wanted to mate these tools together? I could add a mate reference, but the ability to actually add a mate is not in here. So anyway, so command search is really good. Um, 
And you'll notice that whenever I press my S key, look in the upper right hand corner. You see what's happening? Command search is actually open. So let's take interference detection off from this menu. And now what happens when I'm in this assembly and I wanna do interference detection? Now I gotta go find it again. No, I don't. I can just type interference, press the arrow key down and I can bring up the inter, uh, uh, the interference detection command right there. So if your software is not doing this, where it activates command search every time you press the S key right here, I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. We're gonna go um, into here and we're gonna go back. This is a tricky one to actually find. We're gonna go into customize. Um, I always lose this one. I actually think this is, this is actually like one of the harder things to find in here. It's, I'm in the wrong spot. I think I'm actually in tools options for this. And then what we're going to go ahead and do is not feature manager. It is, I only ever have to do this once and and then you find this checkbox and then it appears so let's do this right here so uh that is the wrong search right there right here yeah so uh this guy right here the solidworks search box so you can see i can in turn that on and off and there is actually another way to do that with the shortcut menus. I always lose where this option is in here. Sorry, I'm going a little bit freeform at the moment. I know I've got Mark in the chat. He knows where this is. It's right here. Show in shortcut menu, the context. No, that's not what I want right there. It's an option in here where you can go through and then you can turn that. There it is right here. Okay, I found it. So if you want that shortcut to show up, sorry about that. Uh, you right click, go to customize, go to shortcut bars. And at the bottom here, there is a checkbox. Activate command search when the shortcut bar is launched. And whenever you do that, you'll notice now I can come up here and I can type in the name of a command if it's not on my shortcut menu. So you'll see, I have all these toolbars up here. Most of these are for looks. Half the time I just type in the name of the command I'm looking for, or I put it on my shortcut menu right there. So that's a really cool tip right there. A lot of our videos online, you might not see that because we like to make sure people are aware of my SolidWorks. So we usually leave this menu up, but when I'm actually working in SolidWorks, I always use this tool right here. So that's a really, really good tool. All right, now I wanna talk about keyboard shortcuts because this has come up in the chat over here on the side about mapping keys to make sure you can use that shortcut menu. I had mentioned my shortcut menu is mapped to my space bar as well as my S key. So same place, right click, customize, keyboard, and this a huge menu right here. How are you ever going to find anything? Well, you can type in commands if you kind of have found them already and you have a pretty good idea of where they are. So for example, if I wanna find my shortcut bar, it actually appears in here twice it looks like. And what I've done is, so here you can see, now it's just mapped to my S key. My space bar doesn't work. But if I come back in here, go to customize keyboard, I need to redo that. Shortcut bar, we're gonna add space bar. You just click in there, press the key you want it to work on, and then you hit okay. I'm gonna show you a couple other ones that I use a lot. You don't have to use these, but you remember the example we showed in the sketch where I turned sketch relations on and off. You'll notice when I hover over that, see how it says shift R in parentheses behind it? There is a, that means that there is a shortcut key for that. I have a lot of things that I toggle on and off while I'm working. System planes, temporary axes are something I use all the time. Axes, uh, sketches, all sorts of things like that. In fact, let's do this. Let's turn on some sketches so that these show up in this design. And you'll notice you're not seeing these as I'm enabling them. 
So this view menu here gives you the ability to toggle all this stuff on and off as you want. But I do this so frequently, look what I do. I come in here, I go shift P, there's my planes. Shift A, there's my axes. Temporary axes, which I think are probably the most underrated thing inside of SolidWorks, are the axes that fall on every cylindrical feature you create. They're really nice to reference. So I have this as Alt-A. Uh, sketches are Shift-S. So you can see I can turn my sketches on and off. What this means is you don't have to constantly come into the tree and toggle these on and off. You can just go ahead and hide them and show them. So where did we do that? We went into customize, we went into keyboard, and then we wanted to search for, I typed in view. And it, what this does is this limits this menu down and you'll see as I get down here, these are the things that are in that view menu that a lot of users like to be able to toggle on and off. So here's my axes, my temporary axes, my origins, that's another one I like to do, my planes, my points, my sketches, and sketch relations. So that example where we were in that sketch, let's open up a sketch right here. That's a really boring sketch. Let's go to a better one down here somewhere. I had a pretty cool one somewhere. Here, let's do this. Let's turn my sketches on. So see how all my sketch relations are visible? I can just turn them on and off. So that issue we talked about earlier, well, you map that to a hotkey, guess what? Now you can go in there and find the problem areas really, really fast, turn them off, get out of there, and guess what? Now I'm gonna exit my sketch. We're gonna take a look at this option in just a minute and how I customize my, um, my mouse gesture. So we're kind of carrying on with UI. I wanna show one last thing. So customizing your keyboard shortcuts. The last area you're probably gonna to wanna to customize, and Brian Zayas did a really good job covering this, so I encourage you to go back and watch his live design, but this is a really important one right here. Mouse gestures really speed up your productivity, even if it's just simple little things. And you'll notice, I don't really go out of the way to have a lot of extra commands in my mouse gestures. I predominantly use those for views. I need to access my isometric views, my front view, my top view, things like that. So if where this comes into play when I'm working, you'll see me just, you don't even see the mouse gesture pop up on screen. I do it so fast. But um, what I've done is I've gone into this menu for mouse gestures. So isometric, you'll notice I have that in the upper right of parts, assemblies, and sketches. I don't have it in drawings because there's no isometric view in a drawing. Uh, to, there's no way to view a drawing as isometric. That was completely wrong what I just said. There are isometric views in a drawing. So what I do here is I just type in isometric and then you drag and drop these on to the wheel where you want the mouse gesture to go. And then you can go ahead and um, you can add those to your mouse gestures. You guys are all talking about tab to height, something that was a question we were actually gonna cover in there. Maybe we'll just skip that one, right, uh, as we get to it. Um, all right, so, but here's the here's two important ones I wanna talk about. You'll see that on all my menus, I have okay and cancel. And you'll watch videos online that our team creates and oftentimes you'll see us exit a command really, really fast. So there are two special buttons that are only found in the mouse gesture menu. So if you're looking for a keyboard shortcut to do this or a command, these don't actually have commands. They're just called OK and cancel. So you'll see I, I type OK and I added that to my swipe right. And then I have cancel, which is my swipe to the lower right. Well, where do these come into play? Well, let's say I come in here and I'm editing this feature and I decide to make some changes to it. Well, you can come over here and you can press OK or Cancel in the upper left. You can come up here to the upper right and press OK or Cancel. But for me, I just like to swipe my cursor and be done with it. See how adding OK and Cancel to those makes it really, really fast to go in there and exit those. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna do something here a minute. 
the next thing I wanted to look at was there. Let's see. Let's go down to some of these other questions. We did user interface. Ah, I wanted to show this from episode two. We are not going to get through all these questions today. Uh, there was a question about something that kept popping up on screen while um, Brian Zayas was working on his monitor and they didn't know what it was. It was the arrows. Well, Brian was actually referring to in their video, they were referring to um, uh, the relationships that you can add. So I'm going to right click on my tree and you see these two buttons, dynamic references, visualization. What they do is they allow you to hover over items and show how they're related. This is probably a bad example. Let's go into this file. And you'll notice when I hover over this mirror, it tells me that the fillet, the cut revolve one and cut revolve three are children of that mirror. They depend on that feature to be there. Likewise, the mirror command depends on boss extrude two in the right plane to always be there. So there was a question about this, but it brought up another question that I thought was important to cover here. So if you like this view, this hover over it view, you do that by on in any feature manager tree, you right click and there are two buttons, visualize parents and visualize children. If you ever just need to see parent child relationships, you can always right click and there's an option here for parent child and they will show you those same parents and children. So I wanted to show another feature that I think is really, really cool and it doesn't get used enough inside of SolidWorks. And let's say I'm working in this assembly and there was this sketch I wanted to, I wanted to find this feature in here. You'll notice when I select on it in the upper left hand corner, what you see here are something we call breadcrumbs. These are a quick and easy way. Maybe I wanted to open that part or I wanted to edit that part and not that face. So I know these are commands that are available kind of from that menu. Maybe I wanted to edit that feature. You can come up here and look at this. You can click on, there's the cut revolve and look in the tree. See how it highlighted it right there? I can click on the body, the part, or even the assembly that that lives in right there. I can even go in and I can dive into the individual features that make this up. What's cool about this is if I click on this feature, look at that, there's the menu for editing a feature. Okay, well that's sort of good. That's kind of out of the way and nobody ever really notices this, right? Um, ooh, there, Casey's got a good one. Show flat tree view is awesome. Like the dynamic references. We're gonna take a look at flat tree view. I totally agree with you. I'm gonna show you an example why that's important too. I did that actually in my gears demo, we did that. Um, so what I want to show you is maybe you like the idea of these breadcrumbs, but you want them to be closer to your cursor. Well, if you select something and press the, um, the D key, oops, I must have remapped my D key. Normally your D key would bring these commands right to it. It looks like I may have remapped those. So in the default interface, when you select something and press D, I am pressing S that's why no. Yeah, I must have remapped that to something else right there. My apologies. So normally that would bring that down to your cursor there. Uh, in the comments, they were talking about flat tree view. I want to quickly look at this one. This is a great question that's kind of getting brought up here. Um, let's roll back my tree. So we just look at a couple pieces of this. And I also want to look at tab to height because this was being taught about a lot. A lot of people know about this in the assembly view. I want to talk about why it's important to know about tab to hide. So let's talk about tab to hide really quick. So in my model here, I have, I'm doing a bunch of multi-body stuff. You can see I have all these uh, journal bearing or these uh, main bearings and then I have a journal bearing and then I have this counterweight I created. Um, when it was who did that one? Not Mike Sabochek. It was not Brian. And when Andrew Barnes did the snowboard wax iron, there was a question. He was hiding and showing surfaces very, very easily. That ability to tab to hide is actually available in a multi-body file as well. A lot of people know you can do this in assemblies now, but these are also available 
um, at the part level for multi-bodies. And then you saw me just magically bring everything back, right? So I press tab and I can hide these bodies and you can see that they're hiding in this tree. But if you use shift tab and I'm holding them down, I'm pressing shift and holding tab, watch, I can just move my cursor over top of the models and look, they've all come back. Another tip, if you get stuck and you're like, I've hidden too many bodies right here, uh, you can just right click on your bodies folder and it's kind of awkward. I have to hide them all, but then I can show them all right there. So there's one thing there. Now I want to get back to the question that we were looking at that Casey talked about show flat tree view. This is a pretty awesome one right here. Let me see if I have any sketches that are shared in this. This one I think is actually, you know how to find out if they're shared. Let's do this. Okay, so sketch three here is used inside of multiple features right here. So does anybody wanna take a guess at when sketch three was created? It was created back here before this feature. So maybe you want to go back and you wanna edit this sketch without all these features being visible. So how do you do that? Well, you can come into here and you can edit this sketch and it will roll back, but maybe you need to separate that sketch out. The thing that Casey is talking about in chat is there is an option up here where you can show your tree display as a flat tree view. Now watch where sketch three ends up right here. See how the order of all my features reordered? This is the actual physical order that I created these individual features in. This is a very good way to understand your designs as they're evolving in so like you, this sketch all the way back here at two, see how I created this early on in my design? Well, look at this, when I turn this back off, let's go to, uh, where did sketch two go? It's like, I guess I did create it right there. I wasn't doing anything special. I thought that one was done later, but uh, that can be really useful. Sometimes you just need to temporarily work on a sketch outside uh, of the feature. So here's another tip you can do. Maybe I need to work on sketch two prior to it being part of this journal. Here's a really cool trick. This has been in the software for the long time. You can drag the rollback bar between the feature and the sketch, and then you'll get an option here to temporarily unabsorb these features. In fact, let me not do it on that one. What was the feature we did? Sketch three, this is the one that was used everywhere. Watch this, I'm gonna temporarily unabsorb this and hit okay. And now look, sketch three is no longer inside of these features right here. They would like to see the rollback bar be bigger. I don't disagree with that. I also would prefer that this not be roll back before this feature, but roll back right after this feature. So Dennis, I'm with you. Improvements to roll back are always appreciated. I love the rollback bar. I think it's something super cool, but everything can always be uh, improved upon. So here's, uh, here's another tip. If you ever roll back and you just wanna roll to the uh, end, you can just right click and roll to end. So a little bit of a tip about different ways to view that tree. As you go through there, I'm trying to look at where we're at. We got about 12 minutes. Let me dive into here, see what. We did hiding bodies, multi bodies. It looks like Mark Peterson actually covered this last week in his live design. So if you haven't had a chance to watch Mark Peterson's, go back, check out his live design as well. I'm sorry, his was two weeks ago, episode 13, the secret behind the best designs. Uh, if you want to learn some cool multi-body tricks, I encourage you to go check that one out. Oh, this is one of my favorites right here. Let's find another cool sketch for this. That's not a very cool sketch. You'll notice I make my sketches very simple uh, when I go through here. This sketch was, what was the big complex one? It was sketch three, right? Yeah. I do a lot of referencing in here. This is a bad example. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's create a new part. And let's just start a new sketch. 
hotkey. I press the L key for my line command, or I use my shortcut bar and I go to L that we saw right here, or I press space bar and I type line and hit enter. See how all those tools we looked at right there, all those options for keyboard shortcuts, customizing the shortcut menu and command search all kind of come together right there. I just use all three of them and you can use any one of those when you go through here. So, all right, I'm going to just drag, let's make this somewhat interesting, I guess. This is Mark Schneider. If you watch his model mania video, he does this so subtly. Uh, there was a question about it. I think somebody missed it because I know Mark always covers this in pretty good detail. Mark already knows probably what it is I'm going to be doing. I should have done this earlier. I'm just going to add a bunch of dimensions. Does everybody know why I'm adding all these dimensions? What the goal is right here? What's wrong with this sketch? I have one blue entity. That means that this entity can be dragged around. We always want to fully define it. Always want to have all the geometry uh, solid black right there. All right, so a question was asked in one of the sessions, how do you change the reference points for a dimension that's already set? So right here, I don't want this 30 millimeter dimension to be dimensioned to here. I actually want it to be dimensioned to here or here. This is actually a really cool trick, something that's been in SolidWorks for a really long time. When you select a dimension, if you pay close attention, and this is one of those things that I think it was Dennis mentioned it in chat. You need some pretty good surgical skills to do this. You can drag the endpoints of these dimensions and you can reattach them to something else. See how as I drag that, this blue line highlighted? Well, look at that. I have updated it to be 60. Oh, but I've overdefined it, right? So what just happened here? Well, this dimension was defined here. So look at this. I'm going to just drag this one down to here. See how you can redrag those, but be careful because of what I just did. The distance from here to here was previously defined. And basically, and with this 80 millimeter dimension, the overall height was defined. Yes, Eric, Toby Schnars will sing the fully defined song. Uh, fully defined, so, you know, I'm going to go back to the very beginning. People asked about CSWP and CSWE a lot. You should always be looking for this, your sketches to be fully defined. That is the core. You will, every one of these demonstrations, you will hear somebody say, make sure everything's fully defined. Casey brings up a good point. You can also replace entities to broken geometry. Let's take a look at what he's talking about right here. I'm gonna go ahead and we're going to extrude this out. I don't even care about how long it is. And we're gonna quickly add a circle in here. Um, so here's another tip too. This is, you can, while you're dragging it, see how the dimension is highlight. I'm pointing to my screen and you can't see this. See how there's a 39.36 dimension. I can just type 30 and it will enter that dimension for me right there. You can do this about any time you want. So I come into here, I place this dimension and then I'm going to make this one 15 and we're going to come into here and we're going to make this one 30 and Let's change this actually, let's make this 18. And we're gonna cut this, I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna say through all, and if any of that causes any questions, let me know. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to this sketch and I'm gonna delete this step right here. And we are going to, this is a bad example because of where I put the hole, but it'll we'll work with it. Look at this, sketch two has a warning which may cause subsequent features to fail. Would we like to repair it? Now, you could say stop and repair it and open the sketch. I'm just gonna hit continue and ignore and you'll see we get a warning here. What's the warning? Well, the geometry that I had applied that to is no longer there anymore. So this circle is no longer defined. See how the geometry has turned uh, brown in this case? When you select this dimension, you can actually see the red endpoint here and the red dotted line that it used to apply to. Just like we did in that sketch, we can grab that endpoint and we can reattach it to something else. And here's what's cool. See how 
instead of keeping the 10 millimeter dimension I had, it updated the, or like here, see how it's 18? I'm gonna grab this one and we're gonna drag it down here. It updates it to 12. It did everything it could to preserve this geometry right here. And then if I wanna change it after the fact, I can come in here, go 30, and now I'm good. And that sketch is all fixed. So pretty good tip right there. Casey, thanks for bringing that up in chat. That's a really good thing people should really know about. Um, <clears throat> is there an option to customize the buttons in the view heads up toolbar at the top? Yes, there is, Dennis Griffin. You'll notice my options up here are not standard. I have zoom to area and zoom to fit, which I don't think are included by default right here. So what we're going to do, how would I add uh, zoom to fit? I'm gonna type zoom, let's do zoom out. No, that doesn't have an icon. So here's the thing, anything you wanna add to this heads up display has to have an icon. I almost got in trouble. Let's add diametric view. All I have to do is drag, do is drag this out. Oops, I gotta do this one the old fashioned way. I just got myself into trouble there. All right, so we're gonna come into here. Um, I need my standard views is what I need. Standard views, and we're gonna grab that. So say I want diametric. We can drag this and see how you can actually add a button to the command bar, the heads up air. Uh, I think it was Dennis asked that. You can drag any command you want up here. And now I always have diametric view available. So you'll notice I put things like my, I put my standard view drop down up here for this reason. There's like those particular views that I'm always looking for. Here's another tip. If you ever wanna get rid of a button off of a toolbar, hold your alt key and then click and drag it and see how easy that is to remove it. So like right here, reference geometry, hold alt, get rid of that. Eric says zoom to selection in normal too. Yep, I have zoom to select. I don't have it on here right now. I always, I don't know why I don't. I think I normally do. We change our UI a lot. Here's another thing I was trying to show right here. So my reference geometry that I just deleted right there, I should have pointed this out earlier. You can always grab any command out of command search here and you can drag this out onto your toolbars right here. All you need to do, and I grabbed the wrong one. Why am I not getting the one I want right there? I have no idea why I'm like uh, stumbling over the things I don't want right now, but yes, you, you saw I could drag that command out. You can drag most commands out of here. Yeah, it's grabbing the wrong one. That's kind of funny. All right, whatever. Uh, all right, so let's go here. Show a pattern-driven pattern, or how can I make it? We're running out of time. I got one last thing. We're gonna go to chat. Um, somebody wanted to know about creating a pattern so it always matches something. And we I actually am gonna show something brand new that was released in SolidWorks 2020. So if you're on an older version of SolidWorks, unfortunately, this is something really cool. Part of this always existed before inside of SolidWorks. I'm gonna show what's cool about it in SolidWorks 2020. And by the way, Eric Beatty, Beatty in chat, by the way, hey, I just taught Eric something new, power user that you could use the alt key to drag. This model is from Eric, actually, uh, part of our what's new material here. This is a pattern not a lot of people fully understand um, I would like to show people this because I think this is my favorite kind of pattern. Um, so see how I have all these holes on this plate right here, all the, how Eric created all these countersunk holes on this plate right here. Um, and then I have a screw and I, I dragged and dropped that out of toolbox and I snapped it into place. Now I want to pattern it. Here's the tricky part. Check this out. I'm going to go into detail so you really understand what happened here. So. This counter bore for an M6 socket head cap screw. See how it was created on both sides? Look at this. We did this with a 3D sketch. Has anybody ever used a 3D sketch to create hole wizard holes? Did you know you could use a 3D sketch to uh, add hole wizard holes? 
Well, you can. So look at this. I have eight holes on this side, eight holes on the back side. What's the magic? You're gonna you're gonna see magic right here. This is my favorite feature. There is a type of pattern in an assembly that we actually added a really cool capability in 2020. This has always existed. Pattern driven component pattern. And we're going to say the component we want to pattern is this fastener. And I don't know if I want to show this trick because of lack of time. Look at my cursor. See how my little cursor, there's a little uh, arrow on the right mouse button. Watch the property manager on the left hand side. When I right click, see how it just highlighted that screen right there? We want to drive this off from this feature right here. Now, the preview is a little off. What it, I need to do is I need to tell SolidWorks where what's the original hole to reference. So I say select the seed pattern position and see how these little purple dots appear all over the screen. I'm going to select this one right here. Boom. Now look at this. See how it places a fastener in every hole. Well, you're probably here. I'm going to I'm going to turn this option off so you guys don't get the so I can sit, create some suspense. So in the past what it, you would happen is it everywhere that feature was patterned, it would create a copy of that part. So this is really cool. Here's the problem. Look at this. It copied them to the back, but the screws are going the wrong way. In 2020, we added this really cool option specifically for fasteners. You can allot, or not fasteners, to hole wizard holes. Hole wizard holes know the direction that they go. We have this new option called align to holes. Look at this. One feature, I just added 15 more fasteners to that design. That's pretty cool, right? I love this. This is my favorite kind of pattern, Pat pattern-driven component pattern. If you've never used this before, I highly encourage you to give it a try. Even if you're not in SolidWorks 2020, um, give that a shot um, and uh, try to use it. All right, we are at time. I'm going to quickly look at a couple things on this list. Show pattern driven pattern. Show that would have been a good one. So the only thing I there were two things I didn't cover. One was somebody wanted when I did my live design, somebody wanted to see how I did the worm gear. I'll show that really quick. Let's do this. Discard all my changes. Okay. Okay. Don't show me this again. Yes. Yeah, so great point from Olga, our producer right there, uh, or SolidWorks is the name there. Um, if you have any questions, in fact, what we're going to do, I'm going to pose a challenge to everybody at the end of this. If you have any questions of stuff you want to see in the future, things we didn't cover today, tips and tricks you want to learn, when this video is over, there will be a comment section down below. Not the live chat, the comment section down below. I want you to put in the comment what you want us to cover on another one of these Q&As or a whole live design session. We want ideas. Do you want to see visualize, simulation? Do you want to see routing? I don't know. Everybody who posts a comment, we're going to go through and randomly select two winners. And we're going to send you a pair of these awesome SolidWorks socks. Eric, you cannot get a second pair of socks. You've already gotten a pair from us. So when we're done with the video, go into the comment section. We're going to send you a pair of SolidWorks socks. We're going to select uh, maybe two or three people's comments. And we're going to go out there. We'll reach out to you on YouTube. We'll make sure we get those to you. So if you have an idea for a, a tip or a trick we didn't learn, um, make sure we get back to you. All right. So I want to really quickly show a couple things here. Visualize. We have visualized. So if you didn't, Carlos, if you didn't join us in the beginning, we will be covering SolidWorks Visualize next Friday. Mike Sandy is going to do SolidWorks Visualize. So make sure you tune in next Friday. We're going to open one last model here really quick. This was from my live design. And somebody wanted to know how I did this, this worm gear right here. So if you want to see how to create these tooth profiles, um, I did a live design session back on the 1st of May. So you can go into the playlist and find that there. All I did 
for mine was I created an initial outline. I'm not gonna go into all the details about how I did this, but we created what's called the helix feature. So we created a curve. The trick to making this helix feature working is notice I started it off from the ends of this geometry right here. And then I created a sketch. I don't remember, this sketch was for uh, my pitch angle. And then what we did is I created a profile up here and then we created a cut sweep around there. Maybe we'll talk about sweeps and lofts in another future live design. We're already over time. This would be really complex to dig into here. I'd be happy to do this later on down the road on another one. So um, I don't know. I wish we had more time to cover more things here, but uh, yeah, we're kind of at time. We'll do another Q&A in the future. It looks like the response has been pretty good. Um, I will continue to work on my audio and video for my webcam and my microphone. I apologize for it crackling. And uh, I thank everybody for tuning in today. And yes, we are planning on continuing to do these. Stay tuned next Friday, Mike Sandy, SolidWorks Visualize. Um, Michael Steves is gonna show uh, apps for kids down the road. Really cool way to get young people interested in SolidWorks engineering, so. Uh, or just engineering in general. All right. Thanks, everybody.